2 Corinthians chapter 6. Father, again, Lord, it is a privilege that we get to gather together in your name, Lord, that we get to worship you, that we get to sit and consider you a word together. Father, thank you. Um, Though it's a rainy day, thank you. Thank you that you provided all that we need as individuals and as a and as a flock. Lord, uh, we never want to take that for granted. And tonight, as we walk through the Scripture, may we hear from you, our Father and our Shepherd, our Lord and our Savior, our King. Lord, we want to hear from you, from your heart, not from the preacher. But Lord, to really connect with you and know your word in your heart. So, Father, please, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, we've been kind of going through an outline. It's been developing as we've been walking through the book so far. But in chapter 1 and verses 1 through 11, we looked at comfort for the minister. Paul talking about comforting those with the comfort that he had been given. We looked at the confidence of the minister. And then we looked at the compassion of the minister. Then in chapter 3, we looked at Paul's credentials in the ministry and the covenant that he preached. Then we looked at courage in the ministry and Paul's commitment in the ministry as well last week, his commitment to please God and his commitment to preach the gospel of reconciliation. And now we move to another C, that is consecration. Verse 1, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now remember in the last chapter that Paul had pled with the Corinthians. He said, be reconciled to God. We talked about reconciliation. That is being brought back to a better state. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, be reconciled to God. To those who were unsaved in the church. There were those who were rebellious in the church. A minority that wasn't accepting Paul's authority. The majority of the people, though, were. And Paul's calling out to that rebellious minority. Be reconciled to God. I love it because he didn't say, be reconciled to me. Paul wasn't the... He he wasn't focused on himself, but because he was committed to preaching the gospel of reconciliation, he pleads with him. He says, hey, be reconciled to God. He pleads a different way. He says, I plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, you have to wonder, what does that mean? What does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? It really means to receive God's grace and still remain in a sinful lifestyle. That's what that is. You have to understand that the Corinthian church was planted in a society that was saturated with idolatry and sensuality and human philosophy. It was very indulgent. And so the people who were coming to Christ in that church were coming, but there was baggage. Let's face it, people come to the Lord, they're not perfected immediately. In fact, none of us has been perfected yet. And there were issues. But Paul's heart was that they would not receive the gospel and yet remain in a sinful lifestyle. You see, within the Corinthian church, there were those who came to faith, legitimate faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore were justified before God, and then were moving on in consecration or sanctification. But there were also those who had come to Christ who were just sitting in the pews. They really weren't moving forward at all. And the church really is made up of essentially those two groups, isn't it? You guys look at me like you're about to get blasted in the Scriptures. (laughs) Like, oh no, which one am I? Listen, here's the truth. As far as believers go, there are those who believe and are moving forward in faith, and there are those who believe and are not moving forward. Now, Within the church building, there are a couple other groups. There are those who don't believe at all. And there are those who claim to believe and add other things to Jesus. And Paul was dealing with some of them, the Judaizers. Oh yeah, well, you have to believe in Jesus, but you have to follow the law as well. And that simply isn't the truth. 
So Paul really begins to speak to them regarding consecration or sanctification. The two terms are synonymous. You see, consecration or sanctification is being sort of set apart for the purposes of God. In the Greek mindset, if something was set apart for God's purposes, it was only used for Him. That is typically talking about marriage. In the Greek mindset, sanctification regarded marriage. Therefore, my wife is only for me, and I'm only for my wife, exclusively for each other. In the Hebrew mindset, the idea of consecration, dedication, sanctification dealt more with the temple instruments. Anything used for the worship of God could only be used for the worship of God and for nothing else. That makes sense? And that's what Paul's talking about here, saying don't receive the gospel of God or the grace of God in vain. Don't receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and then continue to live in the same lifestyle. Rather, determine or dedicate yourself to be used only then for the purposes of God. That's essentially what it is. A believer once asked a preacher, how would you define consecration? Holding out a blank sheet of paper, the preacher replied, sign your name at the bottom of this page and let God fill in the rest. I think that's very good. I think it puts a good mental picture in our brains of what this really is. I signed on the dotted line. Back in July of 1993, when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And as much as I possibly could, I've allowed Him to fill in the details. Once in a while, I've tried to erase something He's put in and added my own. It never quite works out that well. But Sandy and I determined to let God have His way in our lives. It hasn't been perfect. We're still pressing on. But that's the heart of it. You see, you can't... Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and accept the things that are contrary to Him. You see, we have a tendency to love Jesus and tolerate sin, don't we? We don't think we tolerate it, but we all have cable television. and Not that cable television is a problem, but let me tell you, there's some pretty weird shows out there. There's just some weird stuff on TV. Things that are unholy, that aren't right, that are depraved in nature, and we think, well, it's just TV. It's funny, they call it reality TV, don't they? See, you can't have your Lord and have the world sin also. If you're saved, then you have to be moving forward. You're not moving forward to attain salvation. You're moving forward because you have salvation. Salvation is only by... Grace alone, but grace never remains alone. Works ultimately come out of that. They're the byproduct of a legitimate faith. Paul says, I don't want you to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, having said that, I want to make a clarification. If you're moving forward in faith, will you fall into sin from time to time? Absolutely. But will you try to get out of it? Absolutely. Imagine a cute little lamb moving through the pasture one day and falls into the mud bog. What's that little lamb going to do? Go ahead, Damon, make the sound. That's right. He's going to try to shake it off, and he's going to get moving out of the mud. However, if you're walking along the pasture one day and you see the mud bog and you leap into it and begin to roll around, perhaps you're not a sheep, you see. Because by nature, those two animals are different. There's one that wallows in the mud, and there's one that falls into the mud. The difference is their nature. Verse 2, for he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul here is quoting the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 49, verse 8. This passage here is a call for God's people to go out and share salvation with those who are not God's people. Contextually, this is really about evangelism. It's not about salvation per se. It's about God's people going out and sharing 
the gospel. See, that's the work that we're supposed to do, having now come to faith in Christ. How many of you believe in heaven? How many of you believe in hell? How many of you still don't know? Okay, if you really believe in heaven and really believe in hell, don't you think you should go out and tell someone? Because hell is a terrible place to be. And heaven is available to any and all who would receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's the good news of the gospel. If I have good news, the last thing I want to do is share it. I mean, excuse me, share it. I do want to share it. The last thing I want to do is keep it to myself. And this is really Isaiah's thing here before the people. God's saying to his people, Israel, that I'm going to send you out to the Gentile nations to share salvation with all. We read this verse in Isaiah and we think, oh, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day I need to get saved. Well, if you're not, that is true. But what's really being spoken about here is going out and sharing the gospel. He says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Some of you, you know God's been tugging at you. You've got a co-worker who's miserable and bitter and disenchanted and insecure and hurting, and you think, boy, I, I should probably share the gospel. Yes, for heaven's sake, that's the day. Tomorrow isn't the day. Tomorrow is not the accepted time. Today is the accepted time. You know why? Because there's no guarantees tomorrow, is there? None of us is guaranteed a tomorrow. And so when it comes to sharing the gospel, there ought to be a sense of urgency. Did the Jewish people bring the gospel out to the Gentile nations? No. In a sort of ethnic pride, they looked down on the Gentile nations instead, and so they became a scattered people. And the church had been birthed and pushed out. So, Paul calls the Corinthians to consecration, and now here at verse 3, he begins to discuss what that consecration looks like in his own ministry. He says, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. He says, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. See, Paul had determined to conduct himself and his ministry in such a way that he would be blameless before people. It doesn't mean he was perfect. But he wouldn't give them reason to not listen to his message, to not receive his ministry. You see, there are a few things that are as sad as a man who would serve God with his mouth, but his heart and his attitudes don't line up with his message. It's sad that a man preaches forgiveness, but he doesn't offer it. It's sad that a man would preach sacrifice, and expect others to provide for him. It's sad that a man would preach service and yet expect to be served. And there are many, many ministries that are like that. And they actually produce a barrier between people and God. And Paul says, I don't want to be that way. We give no offense in anything that we may not be blamed, he says. And then he says, but in all things we commend ourselves to God. The word commend here literally means to stand near. He says, in all things we stand near God. The idea in the mind is one of approval. If I'm standing next to God, then I'm approved by Him. That is, I'm doing things His way. See, Paul knew that he was called to share the gospel of reconciliation. But in doing so, he sought God's approval in the way that he did things. Does that make sense to you? He stood near God. He did things God's way. And that way, God is always pleased. Do you understand that God is never displeased when you do something His way? Do you understand that? Because a lot of us do things and we think, I wonder if that was really the right thing to do. If you're wondering, probably wasn't. But if it's God's way, God's pleased. Just live life His way. It's really not difficult. It is difficult for the flesh. But conceptually, it's a fairly easy thing. You see, there are those who serve God, but they would rather seek the approval of men. Because, you know, if you seek men's approval, you can have a big budget. You can have a lot of people in the church. You can have your name in lights. You can have notoriety. And people will love you for it. 
But was that Jesus' ministry? Did he get his name in lights? No, he got himself on a cross with a sign, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. But he did things God's way. How about Paul? Did Paul get his name in lights? Now appearing in Corinth, preacher Paul. No. He just went in, took a job making tents into Corinth and began to minister to the whosoever that was in front of him. You see, you seek men's approval, it'll eventually escape you. Proverbs 29 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. If you're living for people's approval, i got terrible news for you. You'll only have it for a short time. This past week, going through the Gospel of Mark in our inductive class, we saw the people of Jericho looking at Bartimaeus, telling him to shut up. They warned him, be quiet. Jesus stops, calls them over, and they say, hey, be of good cheer. <laughs> That's the way life is. One minute they tell you to shut up, next time they tell you to be happy. People are fickle. If you're looking for people's approval, well, you, you, you might want to find a different God because people aren't going to approve of you following Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said, in all things we commend ourselves as ministers. And now he begins to list out examples of what all things includes. At the end of verse 4 here, in much patience in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. There's a list of things, huh? First one he says, in patience. He says, actually, in much patience. Patience is a difficult word to describe in Greek. The word that we have, patience, and as we understand it, really doesn't fully quantify the word. The word hupomone in Greek, it has this patient endurance with joy and expectation. That's the feeling, the flavor of the word that you get. And Paul says, in much patience. Paul often found himself in difficult circumstances, but he determined to endure those circumstances. How? In patience. In a patient endurance. With joy. With an expectation of coming through. The same concept we read about in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, Paul here is giving them a call to get moving forward, doesn't he? Let us run with endurance. He doesn't say let us sit with endurance, but let us run with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. That word endured, it's the same word, hupomone. That is, he patiently endured with joy and expectation the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This tells me then that Jesus Christ didn't just endure the cross for me, but he endured it patiently with joy and with expectation. That should blow you away. He just didn't endure the cross the way I used to endure my mother's beef stew or beef jerky stew, probably. You know, my mother had that incredible ability to spontaneously make jerky every Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, those are the things I had to endure as we understand endurance. But the writer of Hebrews here says that Jesus patiently endured with joy and with expectation. I'm not saying that he was happy to go to the cross. Indeed, he sweat blood the night before, saying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But you understand that joy is not bound by circumstance. Happiness is bound by circumstances. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is an attitude. And everything can be going wrong, and I can be going through a tough time, and I can still have joy because it's not circumstantial in nature. Happiness, however, is, and sadly, so many of us settle for happiness. 
instead of reaching out for joy. It's an attitude. Jesus patiently endured the cross for me with joy, with expectation, for the joy set before Him, says the writer of Hebrews. Now, if Jesus endured the cross for me with joy and expectation, can I endure my cross that He's called me to carry? Can I do it patiently, with joy, with expectation? I should think so. Now, I've had a few people maybe crucify me with words, but nobody's done it with nails yet. You know what? We've endured it. We're not always joyous, but we're learning. Listen, guys, patience in all things. You understand for you married couples, really for your marriage to work, it only takes one of you to be patient? It's interesting. It only takes one patient spouse. (laughs) Um, We're not going to step into that one right now. Wisdom says do not go there. But now that, you know, Damon mentioned that, there's an old poem says, patient is a virtue, possess it if you can, seldom found in a woman and never in a man. (laughs) I like that. How many of you women say amen? You didn't like that seldom part, did you? (laughs) Oh, listen, guys. Paul says, in much patience. Okay, in much patience when? Now he begins. In tribulations, he says. The word tribulations here literally means under pressure. It's used to describe anguish or a burden or persecution. Paul was often pressured to keep his mouth closed. He was threatened with persecution if he preached. Jesus felt the same pressure too. And I dare believe, especially if you military types in here tonight, that there's a pressure for you to keep your mouth shut, isn't there? It's insane. You know why the U.S. military was great? Not because of U.S. weaponry, because of the God of the U.S. military. And now he's being sequestered, dishonorably discharged from the military. We don't want to hear your name around here, Jesus. Let's pull your Bibles out of billeting. Let's not mention your name anymore in the Air Force Academy. You Navy chaplains, keep it vanilla. Don't get too specific. Sad. People are under pressure. Some of you have felt the social pressure too. Knowing you should share the gospel, but being afraid of what people are going to say. And Paul didn't succumb to that pressure to be quiet. Instead, he stood next to God. He co-labored with God. Patiently endured with joy and expectation. He says, in needs. Paul had needs. He was an itinerant preacher. Most of us at some time find ourselves in need of something, don't we? When we think of needs in our mindset, we think of food, clothing, and shelter. And I would agree, especially in North Dakota. You know, in Southern California, food is good, clothing is optional, and nobody needs shelter because you can live out on the beach. If you've ever lived in San Diego, you know what I'm talking about. But believe it or not, I mean, food, clothing, and shelter are our basic needs. And Paul often went without. Our Lord went out also, ministering in Capernaum. A scribe ran up to him and says, Teacher, teacher, I want to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Hey, foxes have holes and birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Listen, gang. Most of us think we need more than we really do. Can I say that without insulting you? Can I say that with insulting you? Most of us really need a lot less than we really think we do. I think I listen to the salesman too much. You need this. You deserve that. You should have this. Come look at something your neighbor said you could never afford, you know. All the sales pitches. You know, the older I get, and I'm not that old, I'm not half a century yet, The fact is, is I need a lot less. So if any of you need some stuff, please come by my house. I'd love to unload it on you. I am so done with stuff. I thought I needed all those tools in my garage. No, I don't. I've got them at other people's houses now. I've decentralized my tool crib. It's among all kinds of people's houses. It's so much better that way. I don't need it anymore. 
What I really need is to stay faithful to God and do things His way and patiently endure the trials of life. That's what I need. And if He gives me food, clothing, and shelter, praise the Lord. And if He doesn't, praise the Lord. If He doesn't give me food, He doesn't give me clothing, He doesn't give me shelter, I know I won't make it past winter and I'll be home with Him. But I, what I really need is just to do things His way and be patient in the process. Paul says, in distresses, the word stenokoria in Greek is a, a compound word. Steno means narrow and korea means a space. It's in a narrow space, Paul says, in distress. Maybe you find yourself in that same kind of situation, in a narrow place. Between a rock and a hard place we talked about just the other week. What do I do here? Not really many options. I can only move forward and I can only move backward. That's it. What do I do? Hang in there. Stay faithful. You know, there's a gentleman in the Bible in the book of Genesis, chapter 26. His name is Isaac. There's a famine in the land. And Isaac found himself in a narrow place, between a rock and a hard place, and decided to move south toward Gerar, towards the Philistines' country. Began to use the wells that his father Abraham had. His flocks and his herds were doing quite well, and the people of the land got upset with him. The Philistines plugged up the wells and forced him out of the area. That's not so fun, is it? But rather than assert his rights, he moved on. Stopped in Gerar. Dug some wells. Set up shop again. Having good wells, the people of Gerar came by and said, Get out of here. They plugged up as well as they moved him on. Then he went and he dug more wells. By the way, digging wells in those days wasn't like digging today. It was a different animal. It was a lot more labor-intensive. But Isaac dug more wells, and nobody bothered him. And he named that well Rehoboth, means wide place. You see, what happened for Isaac is that the pressures and the narrow places he found himself continued to push him in the direction he needed to go. God was funneling Isaac to a place where Isaac had a wide area where his family could grow into what God had determined it would be. And so often you and I fight that. We don't want to be in a narrow place. We like options in America, don't we? Give me options. We love to go to restaurants that have seven chicken dishes, seven beef dishes, seven fish dishes, a couple salad. We like options, don't we? Now, how many of you go to the restaurant and you spend 45 minutes looking at the menu, trying to choose? Any indecisive people here? So you, you probably spend hours in front of Netflix looking at that menu too, just wondering what to watch, right? We like options. But so often God will limit our options that we can only move in one direction, and that's in the center of his will, and that's what Isaac found. Did he have to dig wells? Yes. Did he have to be patient? Absolutely. But it brought him to the place that he needed to be so that God could do the work that he desired to do. So endure those narrow places, that small house you just moved into. Endure it patiently, with joy with expectation. God will see you through. He says, in stripes and imprisonments. Now, stripes refers to lashes by the whips or being struck with a wooden rod or a cane. Of course, it would lay stripes across your back. Five times Paul was whipped. Thirty-nine lashes each time. Three times he was beaten with rods. His back must have been pretty striped. Our Lord Himself took the stripes, didn't He? Did He take it patiently? Yeah, absolutely. Most of us will never suffer stripes like that. Most of us will never be imprisoned. But there are Christians out there today that are feeling that, aren't they? They're imprisoned and they're being struck. Saeed's one of many. But he's the one that we know the most simply because he's a Calvary Chapel pastor. 
Most of us won't feel that, but I guarantee most of you have felt, well, you've got a tongue lashing from somebody for preaching the gospel, for sharing the good news. Someone's accosted you. People lash out all the time. Paul and Silas were in Philippi preaching the gospel. Paul was a Roman citizen, but he was imprisoned without trial, by the way, which is very, very illegal in Rome, in the Roman world, not just in Rome, but in the Roman Empire. But in the stocks and after taking a beating, he and Silas spent the night worshiping the Lord. Can you imagine? See, that's a guy who's consecrated or two guys who are consecrated. Even taking a beating, they determined to worship God. And that night there was an earthquake and the cells were opened and chains fell off. And the jailkeeper was about to commit suicide because, of course, if he lost any inmates, he'd be killed by the Romans. But expecting that some of them would run, he determined to commit suicide. And Paul said, wait. He said, we're all here. At that, that man ran up to Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to be saved? I love that. Now, that guy's world was rocked. He was shaken up, no question. But having his world shaken and having heard earlier men who were worshiping God, even in their tough times, where did he run to? He looked to them and said, what must I do to be saved? Because of Paul and Silas' patience, because of their consecration, because of their determination to worship God, even in the hard times, people knew exactly where to go. See, even the smallest light shines incredibly bright in the darkest times, doesn't it? You can't ignore it. I can light a match right here. It means nothing to you. We flick out the lights. Every one of your eyes will go right to that match. The match hasn't changed. The circumstances have. And people's worlds, listen gang, this is the truth. People's worlds are about to be shaken up. I hope you understand that. Things are not going to get easier in this world. By God's grace, I pray for revival. That revival will come when we actually become a consecrated people and hate sin. But things are not going to get easier. And the hope that people have is in you. Earthen vessels filled with the treasure of God. The knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share it with them. Don't hold it back. Paul and Silas didn't hold back. That Philippian jailer was saved, his family was saved, and a church presence was birthed in Philippi at that moment. Which became, interestingly enough, one of the churches that supported the church in Jerusalem when they were going through their famine, through their difficult times. He says now here, verse 5, in tumults. The word tumults... We don't really use it in, in today's English so much, but it literally means a riot. And I don't mean riot in a funny way. I mean riot like people going berserk. We're talking like Ferguson, Missouri right now. By the grace of God, that's calmed down. But people were rioting. Social unrest. Disorder. And Paul was known to create a few of those riots in his time, wasn't he? Because he preached the gospel. Ephesus was a prime example of a riot that was started because of his preaching. Happened in Jerusalem too. In Acts chapter 14, Paul's preaching in the city of Lystra. The Judaizers came, not appreciating his message. Got the city in an uproar. They dragged him outside and stoned him and left him thinking he was dead. Paul endured that stoning. He didn't die. In fact, afterwards, he got up. In chapter 12 of the very letter we're reading right now, he begins to speak of that, about the things he saw in heaven. He couldn't put them to words. He had a gl glimpse of heaven. And then he tried to walk right back into the city. He did walk into the city and stayed there the night. He left the following morning. Now listen, if you threw me out of my knot and threw stones at me, you can be sure that I'm going to head south. I am not coming back. Did Paul do that? No way. 
absolutely consecrated, dedicated for the purpose of God and went right back into the city. Amazing. But he caught a glimpse of heaven in the process. And I dare say that we would do too. We'd catch a glimpse of the glory of God. If we would simply consecrate ourselves and determine to patiently endure with joy and expectation, you'll get a sense of the glory of God. When you get a sense of the glory of God, you can move right back into a city that hates you. He says, in labors and in sleeplessness. Let's face it, in the ministry is a lot of work to be done, is there not? You guys know. And sometimes that labor comes at the expense of sleep. Sometimes you don't sleep because there's much work to be done, and sometimes you don't sleep because there's a lot of anxiety. There's a story of a woman, one Sunday after church, decided she'd share with one of the elders of the church the problems she had sleeping at night. So she shared with him regarding her insomnia, and the, the elder said to her, well, he said, I had the same problem, but I finally overcame it. And she said, really? She said, did you count sheep? He says, no, I just talked to the shepherd. <laughs> you get it? She prayed. <laughs> Let's face it, you know what it's like, too. You can't sleep at night? I'll just pray. It happens that way. I say that facetiously, but there's an element of truth in it. A lot of people lose sleep because of anxiety, because of worry, because of stress. But Philippians says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Paul says to the Philippians, listen, don't be anxious, pray. Now, the idea is this, the peace of God will come over you. The byproduct of that is you might just get a good night's sleep. You know how many times I've woken up in the middle of the night and laid there for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, why can't I go to sleep? And then suddenly it dawns on me, hey, why not pray? Five minutes later, (laughs) clunk. It's just that way. And then he says in fastings, That may refer to voluntary fasting, involuntary fasting. It may refer to fasting from food or from something else. But there were times when Paul went without, voluntarily and involuntarily, with patience. You see, patience is a major part of the consecrated life. So, speaking here about consecration and trials, now verse 6, consecration, he describes now in terms of virtue. He says, by purity... By knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. We're looking at virtues here. It says, by purity, that is moral uprightness. The word purity here is directly related to the word saint, hagios. Paul had determined to act saintly in times of difficulty. Are you called to do the same? Okay, listen, act saintly in times. Don't act saintly so that someday you can become a saint, like somehow the church is going to canonize you. That's never going to happen. Act saintly because God has determined that you are a saint already. God has called you a saint, so therefore act like one. And in acting like one, you'll become what God says you are. He says, by knowledge... Knowledge here would refer to deep knowledge or wisdom. Knowledge is a very misunderstood term today. Knowledge isn't what you've heard, gang. Knowledge is what you really know. Does that make sense? T.S. Eliot said that wisdom is lost in a sea of knowledge, and knowledge is lost in a sea of information. We hear information, we know knowledge. And Paul conducted himself then according to knowledge, according to what he knew. You want to live the consecrated life? In difficult times, act according to what you know, not according to what you don't know. Don't act according to what you've heard, 
Act according to what you know. Do you know what you know? You know that God will never leave you nor forsake you. The word never is pretty superlative, isn't it? It's all-encompassing. How often will God leave you? Never. So act according to that. He'll see you through. He'll never forsake you. If you act according to what you've heard, or some people, you know, times are tough, and they begin to get worried about what could happen. And so they try to formulate plans according to what might happen, and anxiety only increases. Act according to knowledge, not according to ignorance. He says, by long-suffering. Well, didn't he mention that earlier, patience? And yet he uses a different term here. It's interesting. I like what one commentator, he said, he said, patience deals with circumstances, long-suffering deals with people. <laughs> That's, I love that. That is so true. Listen, in difficult circumstances, have patience. When dealing with difficult people, have long-suffering. That's the truth. And let's face it, there are difficult people out there. Amen? All of you have difficult people in your life. Amen? Some of you are that difficult people. Amen? I wanted to see who was going to say amen there. Listen, there are difficult people but they're still created in God's image. And the Lord still loves them. And they need to hear the gospel. As much as they grate on you, as much as they annoy you, for heaven's sake, suffer long. Jesus certainly suffered long for you and for me. And in some ways, I dare believe He still suffers because of me. But He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He says, by kindness... By kindness. Stay kind. Sincerely care about people. An old woman went to a branch of the post office in her town because the post employees there were friendly. She went there to buy stamps just before Christmas one year, and the lines were particularly long. Someone pointed out there was no need for her to wait in line because there was a stamp machine in the lobby. The older lady said, I know, she said, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. <laughs> oh, you guys are tough tonight. You guys are just tough. Listen, legitimately care about people. It keeps them coming back. This lady would stand in the line because the person, the clerk at the postal office, would care enough to ask about her. The machine doesn't do that. I, can I have a moment of confession here? I hate the self-checkout lines. How many of you hate that? Oh, some of you need to grow in spirituality, I guess, you see? <laughs> Let me tell you, that is the most dehumanizing. I, I've tried to witness to that machine. It just takes my money. But see, when I go to the cashier line as a cashier there, I always have somebody I can share with. I always have somebody I can talk to. And there are people in the eight years that we've lived here in mine now, we've been witnessing to at Walmart for eight years. One day soon, they're going to come to Jesus. But they're never going to come to Jesus if I go to that miserable self-checkout line, which is the most confusing. Do I put it in the bag or don't I put it in the bag? Do I take the bag off this thing? Ugh. Horrible. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, be kind. Go to the regular checkout line. Love that lady who should have retired five years ago, but she's working at Walmart right now just trying to keep things together. Now, I'm not saying that's a measure of your spirituality. It's just an illustration, but you know what I'm talking about. Some, somehow in society, we've become so efficient, it's come at the cost of humanity. And God called me to be human long before He called me to be efficient. In fact, the church doesn't run efficiently. It hasn't in 20 centuries. But it continues to move forward, and the gospel continues to go forward, regardless of efficiency. I know that cuts across the grain of some of you really administrative types, but I think you know where I'm going with this. We can become so efficient that we can become useless in terms of the gospel. By kindness, he says, by the Holy Spirit. That is in the Spirit's guidance. In the Spirit, being led by Him. 
There's nothing, listen gang, there's nothing like following the Spirit's lead moment by moment. There are those times in my life where I've been so tuned in, so dialed in to Him, and that spontaneous joy and the things that God communicates, it's amazing. And there are those other times when I'm just in the flesh, backsliding all over the place. Paul says, hey, in the Spirit, following God's lead on these things in difficult times. He says, by sincere love. Listen, sincere love. That means none of that fake stuff. You know, talking about fake stuff, margarine, it's fake. Real love. That's what should mock the church, not insincere love. How many of you love the other flock members here? Okay, then for heaven's sake, be sincere with it. Call on each other. Get involved in each other's lives. Don't just call my house. I know you love me. (laughs) <laughs> call their houses and they'll call you listen sincere love this love is agape love pure sacrificial that's living sanctified that's ministering in a sanctified way in sincerity he says by the word of truth that is of course the gospel In difficult times, share the gospel patiently with people. It says, by the power of God, not in our own power. You can't be sanctified, consecrated, holy, and live in your own power. Every day I have to look at myself in the mirror. Realize I can't do it. I see my frail humanity physically, mentally, emotionally. I'm called to live in God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit. My power, listen, at best is going to produce natural results, isn't it? God's power always produces supernatural results. Supernatural results glorify God, not man. And God won't share His glory with another. Got to do his work his way, guys. He says, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. It's interesting. The word by up to this point has always meant in. Here, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and left, the word by is the word dia, which means through or via in our vernacular. Through the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, Paul obviously is alluding to a Roman soldier. In his right hand, he carried a dirk, two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12, you know what that sword is, the Word of God. On his left hand, he carried a shield. Ephesians chapter 6, it's a shield of faith. Using God's Word accurately, that the dirk was a very precise, close combat weapon. It was used with great skill. Use God's Word with skill. And when the enemy blasts you, get behind that shield of faith. Paul says, hey, there was times of offense, there was times of defense. But he continued to move forward in God's power, in God's leading, with God's Word, and in faith. We're going to press on tonight, guys. We're going to get through, by the grace of God, three more verses. You think we can do it? Okay, here we go. Verse 8, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Paul's talked about consecration in difficult circumstances. He's talked about consecration in virtues. And now he talks about consecration in paradoxes. First one he says, by honor and dishonor. Paul was honored and dishonored in his ministry even by the Corinthians themselves, the very ones he's writing this letter, he had been honored by them and dishonored by them. But he stayed true. He continued on. Why? Because he didn't seek the honor of men. He sought the honor of God. He says, by evil report and good report. You know what evil and good reports are? 
the fruit of honor and dishonor. <laughs> That's the truth. People who honor you give you a good report. People who dishonor you, well, they give a bad report. Evil report and good reports are really just indicative of the heart. That's what Jesus said in Luke 6. He said, every tree is known by its fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from bramble bushes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man from the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The things that come out of your mouth, listen, brothers and sisters, the things that come out of your mouth are indicative of your heart. A man's mouth is a barometer of his spiritual condition. And I say that with as much offense as I possibly can. What comes out of your mouth reveals your heart. And the Corinthians are revealing who they are to Paul. A dishonoring minority and an honoring majority. But in terms of consecration, how do you know if you're consecrated or to what degree consecration you are? What's coming out of your mouth? And I'm not just talking about Saturday nights in church either. That's easy. Anybody can paint the old Christian face on and say nice words. But what about at work? What about when you're fighting with your spouse? Because how many of you are in the ministry? All of you are in the ministry. And you're in the ministry some of the time or all of the time. There you go. He says, as deceivers and yet true. Paul was accused of deceiving people. Though he taught the gospel truth, Paul believed everything that he preached. The end of his life out on the Appian Way outside of Rome proved it when he lost his head. He died. People don't die for lies they perpetuate. Not knowingly. Paul died knowingly for what he absolutely believed to be the truth. The two greatest witnesses in a man's life is how he lives and how he dies. He says, as unknown and yet well-known. Unknown here can refer to ignorance. It can also refer to being ignored. That is ignorance or willful ignorance. Paul, to some in Corinth, was unknown. That is, they knew of him, but they ignored him. They knew of his apostolic authority, but they rejected it. By others, he was well-known. They remember the little, short, bald-headed, bow-legged, hook-nosed preacher who came through making tents who didn't take a penny from them, but supported himself and others through his ministry as he planted the church. He asked nothing from them. He only gave to them. They knew his character. They knew what he was about. Jesus is also, in this sense, unknown and known. There are those who know him and yet would willfully ignore him. And there are those who know him, who have accepted, who believe. The problem with trying to ignore Jesus is you can only do it for so long. And one day everybody stands before the judge. You can't avoid it. Some will reject you if you're in the ministry. Others will embrace you. Don't take either of them too personally. <laughs> People's rejection or their acceptance. Don't take them too personally. It says, as dying and behold we live. In chapter 4 he talked about his outward man dying, but his inner man was being renewed day by day. That is the carnal appetites were being suppressed. The spiritual appetites were sort of coming on strong. Sometimes in following Jesus you feel like you're dying, don't you? But if you're patient and you endure, then spiritual renewal comes. And the carnal appetites get chipped away, kind of like a sculptor working in marble, chipping away and chipping away and chipping away until the masterpiece is liberated from the marble. That's God's work in your life. He says, as chastened and not yet killed. The word chastened here literally means to be disciplined. It can also mean punishment. God disciplines, men punish, don't they? And Paul suffered under the hands of both in that sense. He was certainly disciplined by God. He was certainly punished by men. 
and yet not killed. Paul wasn't killed until the day he was killed. Many had threatened, many had tried, but none did it until God determined it was time. He says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, bittersweet times, sorrowful times. We've had good families move out of the area this past summer, people we've grown to love. Sorrowful, but sweet. New things are going to happen for them, for this ministry. God's got good plans. Always rejoicing. Now I know that if I ever go to Tennessee, I've got a place I can get a free lunch. Sorrowful, yes. I know You guys weren't saying amen, I noticed that. But I'm rejoicing. There's people, body members, people of this flock that are all over the country and the world now. I'm rejoicing. Brokenhearted, of course. But blessed just the same. He says, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. From an earthly standpoint, Paul owned virtually nothing. Really, you can't see of anything that he owned. And yet, from heaven's perspective, he was filthy rich. He had all that he needed on this earth and more than he would ever need in terms of heaven. Years ago, there was a Methodist minister who fell in love with the world's most unlovely people. In his very own picturesque phrase, he came to where he actually hungered for hell. He pushed out into the midst of it in the east end of London. For days he stood in those seething streets, muddy with men and women. He drank it all in and loved it because of the souls he saw. And then one night he went home and he said to his wife, Darling, I have given myself, I have given you, and I have given our children to the service of those sick souls. His wife smiled, took his hand, and together they knelt and prayed. And that was the beginning of a work that today is now known as the Salvation Army, the work of General William Booth who looked out over the east end of London and saw the depravity and the misery and gave himself wholly to the work of reaching those people in the east end of London. William Booth dedicated, consecrated, sanctified his life for the purposes of God's service and God's service only. Amen? So... Paul has talked, he's given the call to be sanctified, to not receive the gospel of grace in vain. He's given a description of what that consecration looks like in terms of trials, in terms of virtues, in terms of paradoxes, and then tomorrow is the kicker. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, next Saturday is the so what. That is okay, in light of what he's told us, now what do we have to do in light of that? Amen? So don't miss next week. That's where I beat you. So, just kidding. So, Father, thank you, Lord, again for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you care so much that you would accept us as we are and yet not leave us as we are, that you do desire us to move forward in holiness, in consecration. Lord, I pray this week, as we go through trials, as we go through difficult circumstances, as we go through times of need and narrow places, Lord, may we continue to consecrate ourselves, Lord, to determine to serve you and you only. Lord, that many souls would receive the gospel, that people would see Jesus, that people would come and ask, like that Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? I pray, Father, we burn bright in holiness and not dim in indifference as days get darker and darker. Thank you that you'll never leave us or forsake us. Help us to live this way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.